for tapes of end-time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Friday evening, April the 3rd, 1970. Evangelistic Temple in Houston, Texas with Dr. Derek Prince. Hallelujah. Introduced to those of you who have not met the Bible teacher for this seminar, if you have, we know that you're happy again to receive from the Word of God as he breaks it tonight for the Derek Prince. And I want to say again tonight, it has been such a real pleasure to have had him minister here. May God again anoint him to teach the Word of God. Brother Prince? Tonight I want to speak on one of the greatest themes of the Bible. In fact, perhaps the greatest, which is the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me also say that if any of you left with any unfinished business from previous services, we'll have an after meeting around this altar. Uh, some of you, I know, from looking at your faces, you just haven't got every last enemy out. So we'll have a final brush with the devil tonight. And there may be others of you that have not hitherto come forward. And there will be a time to come for prayer and for dedication, for ministry, We'll have the after service. One thing I appreciate about these meetings is that the preliminaries have been so brief. Because to me, the most important time in a service is not at the beginning, it's at the end. And so many services, so much time is taken up at the beginning, you never get to the end. It's after the word has been preached that things are really going to happen. I was in Brother Hong Sit's church a Sunday night. I preached, I gave my testimony and preached, closed the meeting, went into a room to counsel with a couple of people, and after the preacher had got out of the way and the service was all finished, the Holy Spirit fell. And we had an after meeting that was longer than the meeting. And nobody planned it. Nobody organized it. It just happened. I was an associate pastor in Assembly of God Church in Minneapolis when I first came to the United States. And we used to have a prayer meeting twice a week from 10 till 12 noon. And I, it was my responsibility at that time to be in charge of the prayer meeting. Well... After so many of these prayer meetings, when the people were getting ready to leave, and even standing in the doorway, the Holy Spirit would fall. So I sought the Lord about this. I said, Lord, why does the Holy Spirit seem to fall after the meeting is over? And it was as though the Lord said to me, that's the first time you give me an opportunity to do anything. <laughs> and how true that often is. So tonight, I'm going to preach, and by the help of the, of the Lord, I'm going to step back and let the Holy Spirit have an opportunity. I would like to read to you three verses from Psalm 35, the 35th Psalm, which is a Psalm of David. Plead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive with me. Or more literally, strive, O Lord, with them that strive with me. Fight against them that fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and stand up for mine help. Draw out also the spear and stop the way against them that persecute, my, that persecute me. Say unto my soul, I am thy salvation. Let me read just those last few words again. Stop the way against them that persecute me. Say unto my soul, I am thy salvation. Now that is a prayer of David, which he prayed approximately 1,000 years before Christ. And I have come to see that every prayer that David prayed by the Holy Spirit in the book of Psalms was answered when Christ came. Jesus was the answer to David's prayer. And this particular prayer of David, on his behalf and on ours here tonight, was answered by Jesus on the cross. At the cross, Jesus stopped the way against them that would persecute you and me. And on the cross, he said unto my soul and yours, I am thy salvation. The cross is the answer to this prayer. Tonight, I want to speak to you about the cross. If you want a number of scriptures, you can turn to Galatians. One of the themes of Galatians is the work of Christ on the cross. And this is set in sharp distinction from all forms of man-made legalistic religious system. The great problem of the Galatians was not that they were going back into immorality and drunkenness and worldliness, but that they were going into a man-made system of legalism. 
And it's a remarkable thing that of all the churches that Paul wrote to, the Galatians were the only ones for whom he could find nothing to thank God. Even the Corinthian church, which had adultery and all sorts of things, he started his letter by thanking God for the grace of God. But in Galatians, he was so upset by what was going on in Galatia that he almost took off. He said, after he'd gone through the formal greeting, I marvel that ye are so soon turned from the grace of God. He didn't have a word to thank God. And actually, religious legalism is a far greater danger and a far more serious snare than any form of wilderness or immorality ever will be for the Christian. And one of the great themes of Galatians is the complete contrast between the grace of God in the finished work of Christ on the cross and all man's attempts to make himself good by keeping some kind of religious code. And so the cross runs like a theme through the epistle. The first chapter, verses 16 and 17, Paul says, But when it pleased God to reveal his Son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. And I remember hearing the minister that was used of God in the great revival in the Hebrides in 1948 and 49, when those islands were so swept by the power of God that every bar and saloon closed. There was not a single saloon left open. You know why? Because there was no one to go to them. Everybody that had been in the saloon was in the prayer meeting. Well, what's the good of keeping the saloon open if everybody's in the prayer meeting anyhow? See, there's various different ways of getting a place dry, but that's the best. And this revival came in answer to the prayers of two old ladies who were both over 80 and one of whom was blind. And they prayed on and on and on until God had to answer from heaven. And he did. And he sent a certain minister there who was the human instrument to answer these prayers. And I heard this man say something that gripped me. I may have to put it in my words, but this is the truth of it. Remember that Christianity is not Christ revealed to you, it's Christ revealed in you. After that it pleased God to reveal his Son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. And we don't have much business preaching Christ if he's been revealed to us, but not in us. Then in Galatians 2, 20, Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the present Christian life. It's not in eternity, it's not in the next world, it's here and now in the flesh. And in Galatians 3, Paul says in the first verse, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? that ye should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you. And in Galatians 5.24 he says, They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. And I pointed out in one of our morning meetings, this is the distinctive mark that you belong to Jesus Christ. It's that you have crucified that old, carnal, rebellious nature with its affections, with its motions, with its doubts, with its fears, with its unbelief, and with its lusts. But don't forget that doubt and fear and unbelief are just as much the product of the old carnal nature as adultery and drunkenness. And in the list of those that go into the lake of fire, in Revelation 21, verse 8, those that head the procession are the fearful and the unbelieving. Then we get the adulterers, the murderers, the fornicators, the abominable, and the liars. But that awful procession that heads off into a lost eternity forever in the lake of fire has at its head the fearful and the unbelieving. And fear and doubt and unbelief are just as much the product of that old, carnal, Adamic nature as sexual immorality, drunkenness, murder, and all the rest. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. A Christian does not live by his feelings and his emotions. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. We do not let the senses dictate to us and tell us what to do. Smith Wigglesworth said, and this is one of the greatest remarks, I think, that he ever made. He said, I am never moved by what I feel. I am only moved by what I believe. That's spirituality. It's to live in a realm where your senses don't dictate to you. The majority of professing Christians today are under the dictates of the carnal nature. It can be very polite, 
It can be very religious, it can be very respectable, but it's deadly. I have a friend, in fact I mentioned his name to you, Don Basson. And Don, like many others, has seen that what we eat and our stomach plays a very large part in our Christianity. Now I'm not talking about dietary laws, understand. But in the third chapter of Philippians, Paul speaks about those that are the enemies of the cross, whose glory is in their shame, whose end is destruction, and whose God is their belly. A lot of people are making gods out of their belly. And why I quote Don Basham, because he said to me the other day, said, Brother, he said, I've given up one meal a day. I do much better on two meals than I did on three. And this is why, what I'm bringing out. He said, I have learned that my stomach does not tell me when to eat. I tell my stomach when to eat. How many of you can say that? Who is the master and who is the servant in your life? They that are Christ have crucified that old carnal nature with its affections and its lusts. One of the things that Paul speaks about is inordinate affection. Too much drawn by anything or anyone. We can have inordinate affection for human beings. It can sound good, but it's soupy, it's syrupy, it's sentimental, and it's satanic. I don't know where I got those four S's from, but they sound good, don't they? The truth. And then, Galatians 6, 14, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, whereby the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. You and I as sinners have got just one thing we'll ever be able to glory about. It's not our church, it's not our denomination, it's not our doctrinal purity, it's the cross. Now there are two distinct aspects to the cross. The first is, what Christ did on the cross for you and me. The second is what the cross will do in you and me. And I want to speak briefly tonight about each of these two aspects. May I give you, to begin with, a brief personal testimony of something that actually took place in my life in the year 1942 in a place called Albala on the Suez Canal in Egypt. I was serving in the British forces as a medical orderly. At that time I knew the Lord I had been saved in the army, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and as far as I was able, I was walking with the Lord and serving him, and I became sick in the African desert in Libya, and I was admitted to a military hospital, and I was a year on end in military hospital. Now, in this year, God taught me the great truths of divine healing, and I did not come out of that hospital until I knew and acted on those truths. God spares no time and no trouble and no expense in educating you. When I went into those ho that hospital, I knew that God could heal me by a miracle. But God didn't do a miracle. Now, most of us here tonight have no intellectual problems about believing that God can heal us by a miracle. But most of us don't get a miracle. Thank God for the ministry of miracles and the working of miracles and those that have this gift and every manifestation of it. But if you are depending for your healing on a miracle, I would say in nine cases out of ten, you will never get it. That is not the only way, nor the normal way, for God to heal. And so I was in this hospital saying, if God would heal me by a miracle, he could do it. And he didn't. And then I said, if I had the faith, I know God would heal me. And you know the next thing I said? I don't have the faith. And I didn't. And I spent three or four months in what John Bunyan calls the slough of despond. And then there came a ray of light, one bright ray of light in the darkness. Romans 10:17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And the words that came to me were two, faith cometh. If you don't have faith, you can get it. You do not need to sit passive and wish for it, you can acquire it. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. A little while later I was transferred to another hospital, the one at Albala, which I mentioned, and a remarkable lady, there's only been one like her, a brigadier in the Salvation Army, a female brigadier, who had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and had a work amongst American and British servicemen in the city of Cairo, heard about me, in fact she knew me, I knew her. She heard that I was in this hospital in Albala and she came to visit me. She brought with her her American lady co-worker, a lady from the state of Oklahoma whom I still know today. They had a British soldier to drive them in their car, and they arrived in the hospital. She was fully attired in her Salvation Army uniform, plus bonnet and ribbons, swept into the ward, overawed the nurse, and got permission for me to get out of the bed and go and sit with them in the car in the hospital compound. There, they said, let's pray. 
we also talked. As we began to pray, I was sitting on the back seat beside the American lady, and the, uh, the lady brigadier and the British driver were on the front seat. As we began to pray, the Spirit of God came down very powerfully upon this American lady by my side, and she began to speak in an unknown tongue. Now, I was familiar with that, and then she gave the interpretation of what she'd said in an unknown tongue in English. This impressed me, but there was something further. God did something extra for me, for my benefit in that car. The power of God was so powerful there in the car that it shook the American lady, it shook me, it shook all four of us, and it shook the car. And at one point, that car was shaking and rattling under the power of God as if it had been traveling about 50 miles an hour along a rough road, and it was not moving and the engine was not running. And I knew that God was there. And I knew that God was speaking to me. And when the interpretation came, I knew God was telling me what I needed to know. Now, I do not recall the whole interpretation, but I have never forgotten the central word of advice. What you would call, technically, if you want to give it its correct name, a word of wisdom. And it was this. Consider the work of Calvary a perfect work, perfect in every respect, perfect in every aspect. Now, this lady from Oklahoma, she was not a very elegantly spoken lady, and this language was far above her normal level. In fact, it was tremendous language because I happened to have studied Greek and been a scholar and a teacher of Greek, and I immediately discerned that the Holy Spirit was showing me what Jesus meant when he died and said on the cross, it is finished. For in the Greek language, that's the perfect tense of a word that means to do something perfectly. It is perfectly perfect. It is completely complete. And I realized that the Holy Spirit was interpreting this. Consider the work of Calvary a perfect work, perfect in every respect, perfect in every aspect. No matter from what standpoint or what point of view you approach the cross, it's complete. Every need of every human being for time and eternity, spiritual, mental, physical, financial, material, has been met completely once and for all by the death of Jesus on the cross. This is the truth. There is not a single need that will ever occur in the life of any person that is not already provided for by the cross. If you can consider it, understand it, and apply it. As a result of these two things, the quickening of Romans 10:17 and this utterance from this lady, I realized that God showed me where the solution to my problem lay. It lay in the word of God, in hearing what God had to say to me through his word, and in finding out what Jesus did for me on the cross. And of course I was to find out from the word what Jesus had done on the cross. And I did something that could be interpreted as being a little simple, but I've often said since then that I'm glad that I was simple and got healed rather than being clever and staying sick. I got my Bible out and I armed myself with a blue pencil and I decided to read through the entire Bible from end to end, seeing what it had to say about these themes healing, health, physical strength, and long life. And every place in the Bible I found anything that spoke about these, I underlined it in blue. It probably took me about three or four months to read through the Bible. And do you know what I had at the end? A blue Bible. There was scarcely a page anywhere that I did not have to use my blue pencil. This convinced me objectively more than anything else could ever have done that the message of the Bible is a message of healing, spiritual and physical. There was one particular verse or passage that God gave me, which I've held on to ever since. It was in Proverbs, the fourth chapter, verses 20, 21, and 22. And if you stood me upside down in a corner in a dark room, I could still tell you what those verses say. My son, attend to my word. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. And when I read those words, health to all their flesh, I saw that that could not re leave room for sickness anywhere in my body. If you have health in all your flesh, you cannot be sick in any part of your flesh. And I saw that this provision was made through God's words, his words and his sayings. If I would rightly take them in, if I would attend, if I would hear, if I would look, if I would receive, if I would take the medicine according to the directions on the bottle, it was guaranteed by Almighty God to give me complete health. And that's exactly what I believe. I believe that the Bible has made provision for complete health 
in every area of the physical body of every believer in Jesus Christ. It is the revealed will of God. Those words are absolutely general. My word are life to those that find them and health to all their flesh. And the alternative reading for health in the margin of most Bibles is medicine. There's God's great medicine bottle for the whole human race, for every part of your anatomy. They say missionary medicine is like this. I don't know whether you've ever been in a missionary medical outstation, but they say this is the great principle of missionary medicine. If it's above the waist, you give aspirin. And if it's below the waist, you give Epsom salt. Well, God's provision is even simpler. Whether it's above or below the waist, here's the answer. It's in the Word. There came a moment when I put this in practice. I renounced all further medical aid, thanked the doctors for what they'd done, told them I was going to trust God and God alone, was discharged from the hospital uncured, and spent the next three months taking my medicine. Heat was bad for my condition. I took this decision in Egypt, which is a hot country, and the army promptly transferred me to the Sudan, which is one of the hottest countries in the world. The temperature in Khartoum goes up to 127 degrees. And in that climate, God perfectly healed me. The promises of God do not depend upon circumstances or situations. I was not miraculously healed. I was gradually healed over a period of about three months as I took the medicine. And being a medical orderly myself, I knew how people normally take medicine three times daily after the meals. And that's how I took my Bible, three times daily after meals. Breakfast, the noon meal, the evening meal. I went aside, sat by myself, opened my Bible, closed my eyes and said, God, you've said that these words will be life to me and medicine to all my flesh. And I'm taking them as my medicine now in the name of Jesus. In that way, I learned what Jesus meant when he said in Matthew 4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I lived by it spiritually, physically, and in every way. And when God had healed me, not merely had he healed my body, but he had given me a renewed mind. I was no longer a converted philosopher thinking in terms of philosophical and psychological jargon. Everything that came to me, I classified and understood in the light of the Word of God. I had learned to think in the categories of the Word of God. And this is vital. For Paul says, The natural or soulish man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. And in the same context he said, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. You cannot adequately and accurately express the spiritual truths of the Bible in the jargon of modern philosophy or psychology. It does not work. You have to be renewed in your mind to use the terms and the categories of the Bible. And they're very simple. They are phrases like sin, sickness, Curse, blessing, life, death, very, very simple, basic truths. Light and darkness, righteousness and sin. And the most spiritually minded person here tonight is the mind that simply thinks in terms of the word of God. When you do that, every one of your thoughts has been brought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. To be spiritually minded is not to use a lot of long theological phrases and have a lot of visions. It's just to think and speak about things the way the Word of God does. You cannot be more spiritual than the Word of God. Now, in the course of receiving my healing, and in many years of subsequent study and meditation, I have been doing what the Holy Spirit told me to do. I confess that many times I've been remiss. I haven't done it as thoroughly or as continuously as I ought to have done it. But I have considered the work of Calvary. And considering it, for nearly 30 years, my present verdict is that the Holy Spirit said it all. It is a perfect work, perfect in every respect, perfect in every aspect. And for a few moments, I want to sketch out to you the perfection of this finished work of Christ on the cross. Let us consider first on the spiritual plane. Scripture says in Isaiah 53:10 and 2 Corinthians 5:21, and their quotation, the one of the other, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This is the key to understanding the cross. It was a substitutionary act all through. In every aspect, Jesus, God's Son, took upon him 
as our representative, the last Adam, the representative of the Adamic race, all the evil that was due to a sin-cursed, fallen, rebellious race, that in return all the good that was due to him as the Son of God might be received by the believer through faith. Everything Jesus did on the cross, he did as our substitute. Therefore, everything that he bore on our place on the cross, we are loosed from. We do not have to bear it. If you reject the substitutionary truth of the atonement, you make the Bible a meaningless book. You take away the key of knowledge, for this is the key. And the modern theologians that reject this truth of the substitutionary atonement, exactly like the lawyers of Jesus' day, for Jesus said, Woe unto you, ye lawyers, for you've taken away the key of knowledge. You would not enter in yourselves, and them that would enter in, you are hindering. And this is price precisely true of liberal theology today, the product of 90% of the seminaries that profess Christianity today. It is like the lawyers of Jesus' day. They've taken away the key of knowledge because the key to understanding the Scripture is in the cross. The pattern of the key to Scripture is a pattern of the cross. And when you take away the true meaning of the cross, the Bible becomes, in the last resort, a book without meaning. And that's why it is so to modern professing theologians. They cannot find any longer meaning in the Bible because they've taken away the key of knowledge which is in the cross. On the cross, Jesus, as, our, as the last Adam, as the representative of every descendant of Adam, as our personal substitute, your substitute and my substitute, deliberately by the ordained will of God, took upon him all the evil that was due to you and me, that you and I in return might by faith receive all the good that was due to him. This is the simple, great, basic truth of the cross. Let no one ever move you away from that. Let Jesus Christ be evidently set forth, crucified among you. Take time to consider the perfection of this atoning work on the cross. Jesus was made sin. Why? That we might be made righteous. With what? His righteousness. He was made sin with our sinfulness, that we might be made righteous with his righteousness. And no other righteousness will qualify you for heaven but the righteousness of Jesus Christ received by faith. If you, like the Jews of Paul's day, go about to establish your own righteousness, then you have not submitted yourself to the righteousness of God. You are proud and arrogant and you reject the sacrifice of the Son of God on your behalf. Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. In other words, on the cross, he suffered the full and final punishment for every sinful act that every man had ever committed. And because the full and final punishment has already been meted out to him on the cross, and he has received the chastisement, the punishment that was due to you and me, peace is now offered to us. Reconciliation with God. Romans 5, 1, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Every transgression, every sin, every wrong act that we have ever committed has been forgiven and blotted out of the record never to be remembered anymore. Therefore, we have peace. Now, wherever sin enters in the history of the scripture, the curse follows. And because Jesus was made sin for us, he was made a curse for us. Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that we might receive the blessing of Abraham through faith, the promise of the Spirit. Again, the perfect exchange. Jesus was made the curse that we might receive the blessing. Now on the cross, Jesus said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And there came no answer back from heaven. He was truly forsaken of God. And he was forsaken because of our sin with which he was identified. The scripture says of God, Thou art of purer eyes than to look upon iniquity and canst not behold sin. And the pure eyes of the Father could no longer look in the direction of his Son when he hung on the cross because of our sin and our iniquity which rested upon him. God hath made to meet together upon him the iniquity of us all. 
the iniquity, the rebellion, the transgression, the sin and the curse of all men of all ages met together in one moment of time in the person of Jesus Christ as he hung on the cross. Because he was forsaken, the scripture says, we shall never be forsaken. And when he was forsaken, he was dismissed from the presence of God and in this, as the sinner's substitute, he descended into hell. And because he descended, we shall ascend. Because he went down, we can go up. He died our death that we might receive eternal life. In everything he did, he was the substitute. Physically, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. And with his stripes, the wounds inflicted on his physical body, we are healed. People ask me, is it the will of God to heal? I tell them, as far as I understand scripture, from years of study and practical experience, your question is wrongly phrased. The question is not, is it God's will to heal you? But how can you appropriate the healing which God has already provided for you? If a sinner comes to most of us and says, is it God's will to forgive my sin? You and I would be very foolish to leave any shadow of doubt in his mind as to the will of God. And I would answer him, your sin problem was dealt with 19 centuries ago. All you have to do is receive the forgiveness that was then obtained for you by Jesus on the cross. And if come, somebody comes to me with the question, is it the will of God to heal? My answer is, all you have to do is appropriate the healing which was obtained for you on the cross 19 centuries ago. It's a remarkable fact that in relation to the cross, healing is never placed in the future. Even in the prophet Isaiah, in the 53rd chapter, seven centuries before Christ came, the scripture says, with his stripes we are healed. And in the Hebrew it's the past tense. It was healed for us, as literally as you can say it. And after the death and resurrection of Jesus, quoting Isaiah 53, in 2 Peter 2.24, Peter says, who his own self, bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Not will be healed, not are healed, but were healed. And the word in Greek, the verb that's used to heal, is the standard basic Greek word for physical healing, which gives the Greek word for a medical doctor. No honest person could have any basis to doubt that it is physical healing that is referred to there and not merely spiritual healing. Jesus also made complete provision for all our material and financial needs on the cross. The scripture says he was made a curse for the curse of the broken law. And if you will turn, do not do so now, to that long chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 28, from verse 15 to verse 68 you will find in succession all the curses pronounced for the breaking of the law. Scripture says, All these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. And every sickness that has ever visited the human race is included in the curse. Many of them are specified by name. Madness, blindness, botches, hemorrhoids, fever, and many others. But when they've been specified by name, then the Scripture says, All the sicknesses, which are written in the book of the law, and then it says, and all the sicknesses which are not written in the book of the law. Now, by simple logic, no sickness is left out. And let's be plain, friends, let's be simple. Every sickness is a part of the curse. If you really believe that that sickness you have tonight is a blessing placed upon you by God, be logical, cultivate it, don't get rid of it. And don't go to that poor innocent medical doctor to involve him in fighting against the will of God for your life. It isn't fair. Be honest with yourself. This is one of the hardest things. It doesn't always suit our pride to say I'm carrying a curse around in my body which I don't need to have. But that's what the scripture teaches. And I cannot abide the watering down of this truth. This is one area where Pentecostal people today have largely failed. If the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself for the battle? I learnt this lesson in a very dramatic and sad way. I was preaching years back in a large Pentecostal church in Copenhagen, Denmark. It was a two-week Bible teaching seminar and there were two very well-known Scandinavian preachers. One was the associate pastor of the big Philadelphia church in Stockholm, the biggest Pentecostal church in Europe, and another was a friend of mine, a 
associate pastor and a missionary from Copenhagen. Now, in this church, the wife of the pastor, who was a close personal friend of my wife and myself, was a cripple and sat always in a wheelchair. Now, I decided to deal with the subject of physical healing in that seminar. And I went through it as thoroughly as I know how. You may have noticed that I try to be thorough. I don't try to touch on a thing. I try to go into it. And for two weeks, I dealt with physical healing. And I stated what I firmly believe and what I believe the Bible clearly teaches, that God has made provision for the healing of every believer. And I saw that good lady sitting there in a wheelchair in my front every service. But you see, the fact that a lady sits in a wheelchair in my front doesn't change the word of God. Those two other brethren, I will have to say this, because of the pastor's wife. In order to try and, what can I say, make it less embarrassing for her, be kind to her, hedged deliberately on this truth of divine healing. They were both about the same age that I am, and neither of them lived another ten years. You know what? They, they pronounced their own death sentence. Can you see what I mean? It isn't worth doing that, is it? If anything has ever been a lesson to me, that has. If I'd hedged as they hedged, I probably wouldn't be alive today. By thy words, thou shalt be justified, and by thy words, thou shalt be condemned. It's a very solemn thing to preach the word of God. It does not change to suit fashions, or denominations, or emotions. It's fixed and unchanging. I remember another occasion when I determined that I was going to preach on a Sunday evening on divine healing. And sure enough, by the midday Sunday I was so sick I could hardly look out of my eyes. So I thought to myself, I'll change my subject. I couldn't preach on divine healing, sick as I am. And about two hours before the meeting, the Lord began to speak to me. He said, were you going to preach on divine healing? And I said, yes. And he said, so you're not going to do it now? And I said, no. And he said, well, why not? Well, I said, I'm too sick. So he said to me, well, why were you going to preach on divine healing? I said, because it's in your word. And he said, so you mean it isn't in my word any longer? And I said, no, it's still in your word. Well, he said, aren't you going to preach my word? And I said, yes, Lord. So I preached on divine healing. I don't remember what I said. I could hardly hear my own voice come out of my mouth. And I, at the end of that service, I was just as sick as I was when I started, a little bit sicker. I went to bed, and about the middle of the night, the Lord woke me up and healed me instantly. I wasn't one trace of sickness left. He is the high priest of our confession. The Bible says we make the confession, we hold it fast, and we hold it fast without wavering. Sure, there is an interval between the time you make the confession and the time that ob God is obligated to make it good. And that is the testing period. The Bible says, make the confession, Hebrews 3.1, Hebrews 4.14, hold it fast, Hebrews 10.23, hold it fast without wavering. For he is faithful, that is promised. But if you change your confession, you've lost the battle. Also in the book of Deuteronomy, in the 28th chapter, amongst the curses that are enumerated, you will find these in verses 47 and 48. Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joy and with thankfulness for the abundance of all things. That's the will of God. That you serve the Lord your God with joy and with thankfulness for the abundance of all things. The alternative is, if you won't do that, then thou shalt serve thine enemies whom the Lord shall send against thee in hunger, and in thirst, and in nakedness, and in want of all things. Hunger, thirst, nakedness, and want of all things. They are the curse. And do you know what that is when you sum it up in one phrase? Hunger, thirst, nakedness, and want of all things. It's absolute poverty. And my firm conviction is this, that poverty is a curse. It's not a blessing. It's a curse. And it does not belong to the people of God. And a wonderful truth came to me one day when I was preaching in New Zealand. I saw it as I'd never seen it before. That this also is part of the perfect work of Christ. That on the cross, he took the poverty curse. For he was hungry, he was thirsty, he was naked. They stripped him of all his clothing. He was in want of all things. The curse was exhausted in Jesus. Not one bitter drop has been left for you and me to drink. It was totally exhausted. In Christ, he stopped the way against them that persecute us. He said unto my soul, I am thy salvation. On the cross, every last vestige of Satan's power against you and me was stopped 
The cross is God's great red stop sign. And when Satan sees you hold that stop sign up, he plies his brakes and comes to a squealing stop. No matter if he was traveling at 70 miles an hour, he cannot get beyond the cross. He can't get over it. He can't get under it. He can't get round it. And he can't get through it. That's where he stops, at the cross. And if you know how to live on the right side of the cross, none of these things can touch you. 1 John 5, 18. We know, but the trouble is most of us don't know, that whosoever is begotten of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. There is a place in God where the devil cannot touch you. He cannot touch you spiritually, mentally, physically, materially, or financially. My God shall supply part of your need. Is that right? You think it's all? Have you got all your needs supplied? Or haven't you? Philippians 4.19 My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. You take the poverty aspect of the curse and you take these two scriptures together. 2 Corinthians 8.9 and 2 Corinthians 9.8 That's not difficult. 2 Corinthians 8.9 says Ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Can you see the perfect exchange? The one who was rich with all the riches of heaven became as poor as no one else, else has ever been poor, that we in return might receive of his riches. It's the exchange. And the outworking of it is in Second Corinthians 9, 8. But God is able to make all grace abound toward you that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to all good work. It's worth memorizing that verse, friend. There are five alls and two abounds in the original Greek. I don't know how anybody could have ever got more into one verse than that. I'm going to quote it again, because I feel better every time I say it. But God is able. Do you believe he's able? Let me ask you this question. Do you believe that there'll ever come a time when the power of Satan will be so strong in this world that God will not be able to keep his promises? No, but a lot of people think like that and act like that. Oh, the power of the enemy is getting so strong, it's creasing on every side, we're under pressure, he's going to attack us. Has God abdicated from the throne? Where is Jesus tonight? He's where? At the right hand of Almighty God. And what did he say? A measure of power has been given unto me in heaven and earth. I share it with the devil? No. All power in heaven and in earth has been given unto me. The devil doesn't have a vestige. Do you know what he's got? One thing. Bluff. He's a roaring lion without any teeth. That's all he has. You study the scripture. He's got nothing left but bluff, but he's a past master of bluff. And the moment the Christian hears that roar, most of them begin to tremble. I read in my Bible that demons believe and tremble. I don't read about Christians believing and trembling. I, on the whole, it, it couldn't be called an enjoyable ministry, but I enjoy seeing demons tremble. Not because of Brother Prince, but because of the name of Jesus. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the finished work. Every provision for every human need has been made back into the Galatian situation of trying to live by rules and regulations and what a denomination teaches. You're out of grace, friends. I'm not meaning you're a lost soul, but you don't have the benefits and the blessing and the riches of grace. Grace only comes by one root. You know what that is? 1 John or John 1, 17. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. There's no other channel of grace but Jesus Christ. There's no other basis of grace but the cross. And there's no other means of receiving grace but faith. By grace are ye saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's so simple. It's God's grace through Christ on the cross received by faith. And every need is already met. All you have to do is walk up and receive it. Now I want to speak in closing for a little while on the other aspect of the cross, which is gravely neglected. Not what Jesus did on the cross for you and me, but what the cross is designed to do in you and me. God forbid that I should glory, Paul said, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, whereby the world is crucified unto me and I under the world. 
Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Romans 6.6, 6, our old man was crucified in him. The great basic problem of all human nature is not demon. That is secondary. The root problem, which is common to every child of Adam, is the old, rebellious, corrupt, fallen, Adamic nature. And this is true in every one of us here tonight, preacher and congregation alike. The old Adamic nature is a rebel. We are all by nature the children of wrath because we're the children of rebellion. Every one of us was born into this world with a rebellious nature. That does not justify our rebellious acts. We are responsible for yielding to that nature. But the truth of the matter is, every one of us has a rebellious nature. And the root problem of the human race is rebellion. Many, many Christians that know what it is to experience conversion and the baths in the Holy Spirit and many blessings have never had the root of rebellion rooted up. And for that reason, they never know true, deep, settled, inward, lasting peace. There is no peace saith my God to the rebel. He's like the waving rages, waving, the raging waves of the sea, foaming out his own shame. There's something deep inside humanity tonight that is restless, disturbed, tossed to and fro, and it's rebellion. And many professing Christians have not had this root of rebellion dealt with. They don't even recognize it. In many cases, it began in childhood. If you want to breed a real rebel, Bring up your child in a religious atmosphere with a lot of doctrine, a lot of do's, and a lot of don'ts, but no real love and harmony between the parents. And you have got, for sure, a rebel on your hands. It'll probably be an Assemblies of God rebel, but it'll be a rebel. There are a lot of Assemblies of God rebels. There are a lot of Baptist rebels. I'll tell you just a story or two. I have a friend in the United States whom I've known for about seven years. He's a businessman and a successful businessman. He could retire any time he wanted to. He's been a good friend to me in every way. He was brought up in a home where his mother at an early age, while he was still young, that is, was converted to old-time Methodism. You know, old-time Methodism and new-time Methodism are not the same thing. You know that. And she was a real old-time Methodist, godly woman, but full of rules and regulations. You mustn't do this, you mustn't do that, and so on. And at the age of 16, this son decided he'd had enough of mother's rules, and he skipped home, went out into the world, started to drink, and at his first mouthful of whiskey became an alcoholic. He didn't need more than one mouthful. He met the Lord later in life, was saved, baptized in the Holy Spirit. The alcohol problem was dealt with. Many, many problems were wonderfully resolved, but he could not get victory over nicotine. Now, I'm not preaching that you mustn't smoke. That's your decision. If you want to cultivate cancer, well, why not go ahead and do it? But I would say we have enough problems without adding to them. But this man did not want to smoke. He hated smoking. It tormented him. It defeated him. It took away his peace. And he came to me several times, said, cast this demon out of me. And I did everything I knew. I tell you, everything I knew about casting demons out of people, I did it. And it would go, apparently, for a week or two and come back. And every time it came back, he was more discouraged than the first time. And then one day, he phoned me from the center of the United States when I was down in Florida and said, I'm coming to see you. I'm flying in. I can't stand this any longer. And I thought to myself, well, I have to come up with a solution, and I don't have it. And I told the Lord, Lord, I don't know what to do for this man. I've done everything I know to do. So when he arrived, we went out to a restaurant. He was fasting, and I decided to eat, and we talked. And he began to tell me about his home background and his mother and how he'd run from home. Now, he's a very gentlemanly man. I do not know a better behaved, more courteous gentleman than he is. Outwardly, very, very refined gentleman. But as he sat there and talked about his mother, I suddenly looked into his eyes and I saw that little imp of rebellion. And I said, you've got a demon of rebellion that's never gone out. That's your problem. I took him home, led him in a prayer of renunciation, Told him that he had to submit himself to God, the discipline of God, and the word of God, renounce rebellion, cast it out, and smoking has never been a problem. You see, nearly all addictions are branches that fasten on a trunk. And it isn't really sufficient to cut the branch off. You've got to get the trunk out. The trunk is usually 
resentment or rebellion or a sex problem or a contact with satanic spiritual forces. In my experience, the trunk is usually to be looked for in that area. People say, Brother Prince, get rid of this nicotine demon, this alcohol demon. I say, wait a minute now. Why don't we start with the trunk and not with the branch? Because when you get the trunk out, you never have a problem with the branch. This is the gospel way. The gospel uh, dispensation was introduced by John the Baptist. Matthew 3.10 Now also the axe is laid to the root of the tree. And every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. God is not playing around in this dispensation, friends. He's not lopping off a few branches. He's not trimming you up. He's not making you religious. He's cutting down trees from the roots if they don't bring forth good fruit. It's either bring forth fruit or be cut down. And the old nature, the old Adamic nature in every one of us is a corrupt tree. And Jesus said a corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit. There is no way it can be done. Therefore God's remedy for the old nature is just one thing. He doesn't reform him. He doesn't patch him up. He doesn't send him to church. You know what he does? He executes him. That's the only solution for the Adamic nature is execution. God cannot do anything else with him and neither can you. You can put on a religious front for years but you'll never have real inward peace till you've submitted to the execution of the old Adamic nature. The execution, thank God, took place 19 centuries ago. Romans 6, 6, Our old man was crucified in Christ on the cross. It's not going to happen. It has happened. Whether you believe it or not, it's already taken place. Your believing will not change the fact, but it will change you. That's all. Therefore, Romans 6.11 says, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God has said it. It's true objectively, but it becomes true experientially in you when you reckon it of yourself. And then your confession is the confession of Paul. Galatians 2.20 I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. My old life has ceased. It's on the cross. That nature that tormented me, that enslaved me, that rebelled, that feared, that doubted, that hated, that would not believe, dead. I have a new nature, a new man in me, the nature of Christ, begotten in me by the word of God, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. An incorruptible seed produces an incorruptible nature. As is the seed, so is the nature. The new birth is the birth of a divine, incorruptible nature in you and me, the new man. But that new man can only operate, he can only be effective, he can only achieve the purposes of God if the old man is taken out of the way. And the remedy for the old man is the cross. Galatians 5:24. They that are Christ have crucified the cross, the flesh, with the affections and lusts. And I told you the other morning, remember when Jesus comes, he's coming like a thief, but he's not going to do what a thief does. For a thief takes that which is not his, and Jesus is going to take only those who are his. 1 Corinthians 15, 23, they that are Christ's at his coming. Friend, he's not coming for Baptists. He's not coming for Episcopalians. He's not coming for Pentecostals. He's coming for one group only, they that are his. He's not going to do what a thief does. The great preacher Spurgeon, speaking in Spurgeon's tabernacle, looked out over a crowded Sunday morning congregation. And what came into his mind, I don't know. But he stopped in the middle of his message and he said, If the devil were to come in here this morning and to start hailing some of you out of this church, he said, I wouldn't know whether to shout, Stop thief or not. And I wouldn't either. Would you? Do you know to whom you belong? When the angel came to Paul on that shipwrecked vessel, he said, The angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. Can you say that tonight? I am his and I serve him. If you are his, you must be serving him. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Worship without service is hypocrisy. If you are serving Christ tonight, you know it. If you don't know whom you are serving, you are not serving Christ. God's servants are in the light, the devils are in the dark. In the light you know who you are and whom you serve and what you're doing. But if you're in the darkness, you may be totally ignorant of what's going on. You may be under the power and dominion of the devil without ever having realized it. And there's only one way that his dominion can be finally and effectively broken. It's by the cross. 
You have to be willing to crucify that fleshly nature of you. You have to be willing to acknowledge that the cross was made for you and you belong on it. And this is a humbling acknowledgement. Do you know whom that cross was actually made for that Jesus hung on? Have you ever stopped to consider? It wasn't made for Jesus. It was made for Barabbas. And he was a criminal. And it was made for you and you're a criminal. Every one of us is a criminal in the sight of God. Every one of us is guilty. There is none that has an excuse. Every mouth is stopped before God. There's not an argument. There's not an excuse. It's execution. I told Kermit Bradford the other night, as I sat next to him in the banquet at the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship, I said, the first time I heard your testimony, you said something that I'll never forget. When you were alone in that Methodist campground where your mother had prayed for your salvation year after year after year, when you decided to accept Christ, and you walked down to that front bench which was alone in an empty tabernacle, you said you were walking to your death. And that's the truth. But how few people realize it. When you come to the cross, that's the place where you die. But there's one thing about being dead. Do you know that? A dead man has no problem. He that is dead is freed from sin. It's true. I've told this little story in one of my books, the third book from Jordan to Pentecost. It's just a little picture. Peter says in Second Peter 2.24, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the cross, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness. You cannot live to righteousness till you're dead to sin. There has to be a death before there can be a life. And I gave this little picture in my book of what it means to be dead to sin. I took the most wicked character that religious people could ever think of. He's a brutal man. He beats his wife, he curses his children, he drinks whiskey, he smokes the cigar, he spends his time watching TV. He's just as bad as religious people could make a person to be. See? And one night his wife and the children sneak off to the evening gospel service. And they know full well that if they come back singing those choruses, he'll be swearing at them. They leave him sitting in his armchair in front of the TV with the whiskey glass at his side and the cigar between his lips. Two hours later they come back. But in the meanwhile... Something happened. He had a heart attack and died in the chair. And when they come back, they tiptoe in. They expect to hear a curse. There's no curse. The television is there, but he's not watching the dancing girls on the screen. The whiskey stands beside his chair, but he's not drinking. The cigar is in the ashtray. He's not smoking. He no longer gets angry. He no longer blasphemes. He no longer hates his wife and children. You know why? Because he died. And that's what it is to be dead indeed unto sin. When you are dead to sin, sin has no more power over you, it has no more attraction for you, and it can produce no more reaction from you. They could sing choruses all night in that room and he'd never get mad at them again. And that's what the Bible says is the result of the cross in you and me. And Brother Bradford, I don't know him well, but you remember he said that never again had he ever desired whiskey, never again had he ever looked lustfully on a woman from that one day. Friends, you do not need to keep on chopping off branches. Get rid of the trunk and the root, and it'll be different. I'm not preaching sinless perfection. I'm preaching that it's valid and it works as long as you believe. That's different. Do you know one thing we make a mistake about in the church? We talk about believers and unbelievers. And we categorize people. He's a believer. We put a kind of little mental religious label on him. Believer. We use the word as a noun. Now anybody that knows New Testament Greek will agree with me. There is no noun for a believer. It's the present continuous tense of a verb. A believer is one who is believing. And friend, when you stop believing, you're not a believer. You haven't got into a category that guarantees you automatically a seat in the believer's corner for the rest of your life. If you want to be a believer... You keep believing. Oh, how we have been deceived about what salvation is. Charles Simpson said this to me at the recent convention. He said, brother, he said, we Baptists and Pentecostals, we've been teaching people a false picture of salvation. And it's the truth. We've told people that salvation is just like getting a name tag put on you. Well, I used to sit in the sinner's bench and I went forward and sobbed a little at the altar and shook the minister by the hand and now they've put the tag saved on me. That is a caricature of the gospel. It has practically no relationship to what the New Testament teaches. And multitudes, thousands of Pentecostal people and Baptists and others like them are being deceived to the loss of their own souls. They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Friends, amongst our Pentecostal believers, and I've been in this movement 
as a preacher for 24 years, we have many young people whose lives are a caricature of what salvation is and their youth leaders and their pastors are encouraging them to believe that they're saved and they aren't. Are you? I'm closing now and I want to close with a question. Are you Christ or are you not? To whom do you belong? If Jesus Christ will come back this very hour, do you know without a shadow of a doubt you are his? Paul said, I bear the marks of Christ in my body. Do you? Do you have that outward distinguishing mark? The flesh is crucified. That's it. They that are Christ have let that old carnal rebellious nature take its place on the cross. And they keep it there daily. They mortify the deeds of the body. You know what a mortuary is? It's a place where you put the dead. And to mortify is to keep something dead. And this is done by a continuous exercise of will and faith. The solution is permanent, but the faith has to be continual. By one offering, Hebrews says, hath he perfected forever them that are being sanctified. It's the continuous present tense. As long as you are being sanctified, he's perfected you forever. But if the process of sanctification ceases, the perfection of his sacrifice is no longer valid for you. Now I want to ask you tonight, some of you are here by divine appointment, and I know that. Some of you have never submitted to execution. In fact, some of you have never heard this truth. You've sat in evangelical churches 20 or 30 years. You've never heard the truth of divine execution. That's why you have continuous problems and struggles. Why you're up one day and down the next. Oh, I feel fine today, but yesterday I had a bad day. The devil gave me so much trouble. The devil doesn't trouble dead men. This is not an unbelievable and unattainable truth. It's the simple teaching of the word of God. Now listen, I've told God some time back, Lord, with your help, I'll stop delivering religious lectures. If ever I preach on a truth, I'll give people the opportunity to act on it practically if I can. And tonight I'm going to ask one question, and then we'll have an after meeting, if necessary, afterwards. My question is this, have you ever submitted to execution? And if not, will you walk to your execution tonight. Will you come to the cross and lay down your life? He that loseth his life shall find it, but he that keepeth his life shall lose it. Are you tonight willing to lose that old life, the life of the flesh, the corrupt tree? What do you have to do? You have to hear the word of God. You've heard it. You have to believe it. You believe it. You have to decide it. There must be a distinct decision of your will and you clench it by the confession of your mouth. Believe in the heart, confess with the mouth. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Do you wish to do that here tonight? Don't do it to please a preacher or impress your parents. Don't do it unless you mean business with God. But if you do and you do it in faith and you live in the word, nourishing your faith day by day, this can be the beginning of months to you. Shall we bow in prayer? Now I do not know, I have tried my best to make this message clear. If it could be made clearer, I don't know how to do it. I've tried this one thing to make it plain. And in the light of what I've said, and as the Holy Spirit moves here tonight, I want to ask how many of you will say, Brother Prince, really there's never been that moment of execution in my life. I've been living a double life, two natures, like Rebecca with two Babies struggling in my womb, never knowing which was really in control. Tonight I want to end the old and step into the new. By an act of faith, I mean to do it here tonight. If that is your decision, and you're willing to go through with it, I want you to raise your hand. God bless you. Everywhere I see a hand raised, God bless you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, precious Lord. Those of you that raised your hand, I want you to do one more thing. Stand up and walk out here to the front. Do it right now. And you may kneel if you wish. This is not a deliverance service. This is an execution service. But remember that it's the carcass that the vultures feed on. When that carcass is disposed of, they've got nothing more to stick their beaks and their claws into. Now, those of you that need to leave, we will close this service in a few moments. Please be quiet and reverent and prayerful. For every one of these that has come forward, this can be a very vital and real transaction. I tell you frankly, I believe there should have been at least twice as many come forward. But I certainly would not in any way seek to urge you to come. I will wait a little longer because I know, dear friends, I know God's people inside out. 
the Baptists, the Pentecostals, and so on. You're living on crucified lives, many of you, and the devil laughs at you. There is a territory beyond the cross where he cannot trespass. It's on the cross that Jesus stopped the way against them that persecute your soul. This is the stop sign. If you're living on the wrong side of the cross, the devil still has access to you. He's got a legal right to touch you, to put his destructive finger on you. But on the other side of the cross, there's peace. Oh, praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Believers, be in prayer. Pray that only those that will come that will be in earnest. I'm not really trying to get more people, but I do not want to close this appeal. If there's no room, I, friend, it wouldn't be bad to kneel here today. Uh, there's a time to kneel before God. If you've come forward, I would I even ask you to kneel. Uh, I've never, I don't recall asking people to do this, but somehow I feel that there's something about kneeling that goes with bowing a stiff and stubborn neck. Those of you that have come here to the front, I want you to say a brief prayer after me. I want you to pray to Jesus, not to me. I want you to say these words. Please remember that you must approach Jesus direct, and the way of access is open. Him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast off. Say these words. Lord Jesus Christ, I believe that you are the Son of God, and that you died in my place, on the cross, bearing my sin, my condemnation, my judgment, my curse, every evil thing that was due to me. And I believe you rose again from the dead. You are alive at the Father's right hand. My high priest interceding for me now. Lord Jesus, I come now to the foot of your cross. And by a deliberate act of my will, I lay down my life. I accept my place on that cross. From tonight onwards, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. And yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Christ is my life. For me to live is Christ. Jesus, I thank you for accepting me now. Help me to live for your praise and glory all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I want you in your heart just to have a time of personal communion with him. Just seal the bargain that you've made, the covenant that you've cut with him tonight. Amen. Just tell him whatever your heart needs to tell him right now. There are things that he needs to hear from you that no one else should ever hear. And those of you in the congregation, I would like you to stand to your feet right now and just quietly and reverently worship God and thank God for what he's doing here tonight. Let's fill this auditorium with an atmosphere of praise and worship. If you want to worship God in an unknown tongue, not noisily but just quietly, you do that right now. This will charge this building with the power and presence of God. Kuramandari alama siriya. Umbaramandari alama shariyandar alama. Uramandiri endar alabari alama shakariyandar alama. Oh, bless God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, let your eyes, let our eyes be turned away from man, from human nature from our own selves. Give us tonight a fresh vision of the cross, we pray. Oh, make your cross real to us, Lord, to every one of us, to me, Lord. I pray for a fresh understanding, a fresh vision of the cross tonight. Lord, I thank you that you died for me. I thank you that you died for me, Lord. Not just for the world in general, but for me in particular. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you took my place on that cross. Bless your holy name, Lord. I will never cease to praise you. I will never cease to bless you. To thank you for what you've done. Lord. In the precious name of Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord forever and ever and ever. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. 
Ura balasari ala masari andara la mari andari ala kabesari ala masiria. Oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Beloved, every one of you, take time to worship Jesus here tonight. Don't leave this place till you've really communed with him and felt the sweetness and the fragrance of his love and his presence afresh in your life tonight. He is the rose of Sharon. He can scent your days with the fragrance of heaven. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, death of death and hell's destruction, we praise you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, the darkness is past. The true light now shineth, hallelujah. Glory to God, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. The old things are passed away, all things have become new, and all things are of God. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, we beseech you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God, for he hath made him who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Bless his name, bless his name, bless the holy name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise your wonderful name. Praise your wonderful name. Glory to God. All ambition, all pride, all lust, all envy, all lying and deception, all personal egotism, let it die, Lord. Let it be buried tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. All maliciousness, all backbiting, all strife, all vain glory, all Stubbornness, Lord, all rebellion. Let it die tonight in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 All false spirituality, all false religion, all hypocritical acting, let it perish tonight in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. We renounce it, Lord. We renounce it, Lord. We renounce it. We renounce everything that would come between God and our souls tonight. Take it out of the way, Lord. Cleanse it, we pray, in the blood. Blood it out, Lord, never to be remembered again. We thank you, Jesus, for this great salvation. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God. Oh, bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm going to say a prayer of dismissal now, but if you want to linger in this place and wait further upon God here tonight, I would advise you not to be in a hurry. Sometimes we're such a hurry. We'll go to the doctor. We wait an hour in his waiting room. We'll listen for an hour while he counsels with us. We lie three hours on the operating table, and we have absolute confidence in him. And if God demands an hour or two of our time, we get restless and impatient. So please, I'm going to say a prayer now, and if you wish to leave, do so. But if you've got an appointment with God here tonight, keep it. <coughs> Blessed Lord, we thank you for your sweet presence. We thank you for your blessing. We thank you for the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The redemption price that was paid on behalf of each one of us on the cross. Thank you, Jesus, that you died the last Adam and you rose the second man. Hallelujah. Thank you for this new creation in Christ. Lord, thank you that by faith each one of us can take our place in the new creation here tonight. Help us to walk in newness of life from this day forward. <coughs> Dismiss us now with thy blessing, thy protection and thy direction. Not only for us, but for our homes and families and those whom we love, we pray. Bless the pastor and the congregation of this church, Lord. May they move onward. In the days that lie ahead, may this place be made a center of fellowship and a channel of blessing to many in this city, we pray. For Jesus' sake, amen. God bless you.
and you are dismissed if you wish to leave. Christ by baptism into his death. You're not baptized into a church, you're baptized into Christ, into his death and into his resurrection. And this is the seal upon the step that you've taken tonight. If you have never been baptized by immersion as a believer, you need to be baptized. Don't leave that carcass lying around unburied. Get it underground at the earliest opportunity, preferably by tomorrow night. There's no scriptural precedent for leaving people unbaptized for weeks and months. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.